Sylvia, as a philosopher of mathematics, how do you deal with that perennial question, is math discovered or invented? I suppose I deal with it just like everyone else in the philosophy of mathematics. I weigh arguments for and against the different positions. Um, but I have to say, I find the arguments that are out there for mathematical Platonism much more convincing than those for so nominalism. what are the arguments on both sides? So um, typical arguments for mathematical Platonism, the view that mathematical objects actually exist, are that, um, first of all, it has a sort of semantical advantage that we can explain what makes regular statements like this skirt is red um, true and a statement like 2 plus 2 equals 4. Um, what makes them true is that the objects they refer to exist. So that's a semantical advantage. Um, another advantage of Platonism is that it gives us a way to explain the um, miraculous, almost miraculous effectiveness of mathematics in the natural sciences. Mm. And I think that's probably the reason uh, most people who do have this inclination feel drawn towards Platonism, this very close link with the natural sciences. Mm. On the other side, on the nominalist side, I suppose the strongest argument against Platonism is uh, an argument against the necessity of mathematics for the natural sciences. So Hartree Field, for example, wrote this book in 1980 called Science Without Numbers, mm. where he showed that you could do, you could express New Newtonian gravitational theory without the use of mathematics, without making reference to mathematical objects. That math is more of a model of the world than an, an actuality of the world. Right, or maybe a tool to make um, the expression of scientific theories more economical, more elegant, but not a language that is descriptive and refers to actually existing objects. And, and other arguments against Platonism? Um, so Linguistic arguments? There is, well, there is an epistemological argument against mathematical Platonism, and that's um, the problem of explaining epistemic access to those objects. So if there are mathematical objects out there, how, how is it that we know stuff about them, given that we don't perceive <laughs> them with any of <laughs> our five senses? <laughs> Um, and finding an answer to that question is perhaps one of the pressing, most pressing problems for mathematical Platonists. Mm. But I think that question can be given, although that would entail adopting a very particular form of mathematical Platonism, which is the, the pluralist form, full-blooded Platonism, as it's sometimes <laughs> called. So are there different levels of Platonism? Well, yes, there is, um, there is Platonism regarding... Um, well, there, there are Platonists who believe that there is exactly one mathematical universe, um, which entails that for every mathematical uh, statement, there is exactly one uniquely true or false answer. And that's a sort of standard view of mathematics that's been around for a long time. And in recent years, I would say in the last 10 or 15 years, the idea that mathematics is actually, well, the mathematical cosmos actually comprises a multiverse of mathematical universes has taken hold and is becoming increasingly popular. And on that view, the problem of epistemic access uh, receives a pretty straightforward answer. The answer is, we have epistemic access to mathematical objects or to mathematical theories by understanding that those theories are consistent. So in order to understand the consistency of a theory, you don't need to have access to the object it speaks about. You only need to understand the consistency written, written on the paper, as it were. And, and the multiverse of mathematical universes uh, requires you to use an internal consistency for each to make it legitimate. And That's right. So the way it works and the way it doesn't turn out to be internally inconsistent is that, well, you only ever look at one universe at a time. and. Mm. Within mathematical language, you don't have a way to quantify over the entirety of the mathematical universe. Um, and that's just it. The, the main proponent of this view, um, Joel Hamkins, has an argument for this view that I find pretty convincing, which is there are certain uh, questions about mathematics that have been unanswerable or undecided for a very long time most famously the continuum hypothesis, which is the hypothesis that um, says that there is, uh, that 
the real numbers are the second largest infinity after the natural numbers. And it's been one of the most important open problems in mathematics, and there is still no classical solution to it. Um, but there has been a lot of progress in set theory. And we can now construct set theoretical universes um, in which the continuum hypothesis holds, some in which it is false. And Hamkins argues, well, this is just what it is. Here is your answer to the continuum hypothesis. <clears throat> and I find that answer very convincing. Now, some would use the, um, the multiplicity of universes, of mathematical universes, as a way to undermine the importance of the um, unrealistic uh, uh, power of mathematics and science, because there's so many mathematical um, objects and ways of thinking out there that, that we're s selecting a few that understand s s science. So it's not, it's not that the math is just so totally linked to uh, scientific explanation, but it, 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 in, the, in this vast, uh, transfinite number of mathematical universes, some do and some don't, then we pick the ones that do. So that undermines that argue, argument. Uh, that's right. There is an implication of mathematical, that there is an implication for the indispensability argument. Um, that mathematical pluralism has. So let me just briefly sketch the indispensability argument, the structure. Um, the idea is to say, well, if we can show that mathematics doesn't only function as a tool that makes it easier to formulate scientific theories, but if we can show that mathematics actually contributes a sui generis part of the scientific explanation, mm -hmm then that's a very strong reason to believe that, you know, it, mathematics, well, mathematics exists or the bits of, the mathematical bits of a theory refer to something actually out there. And so, to what degree of confidence are you a Platonist about mathematics? Pretty confident, I'd say. <laughs> so, on a scale of 1 to 100, where does pretty confident land up? 87. <laughs>